Our next presentation is Paul Clarkin talking to AI for data division aquatic species identification. Welcome again, Paul. Hi, everybody. My name is Paul Clerken, and I'm a PhD student at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Uh, I did my master's in shark taxonomy, and I've actually run some workshops for um, FAO on shark identification. So today I want to talk about why I think AI could be the future for shark identification, taxonomy, and fisheries management. Sharks are poorly managed, and that's mostly because they are so poorly known. Half of all shark species are data deficient, and this is because some of these species are very rare, and also because they're hard to tell apart, so it's hard to get a lot of information um, if we can't figure out what species they are. Sharks are currently being discovered at a rate that uh, exceeds any previous time in history, even faster than the beginning of um, the Linnaeus naming system. And uh, as a result, taxonomy and being able to identify sharks is more important than ever before. However, the way that we identify sharks is mostly based on uh, traditional taxonomy, um, you know, the same thing that Linnaeus was using. Uh, and this requires an expert in the field. There is some literature that people can read on how these sharks look to identify them, but it's very dense. Um, the training guides are often uh, a little bit verbose and hard for people to use in the field, especially if they're at sea. Um, and because of this, there's a lot of misidentification. And this can actually be very harmful to life history estimates because if you have different species all mixed up and you have um, you know, different estimates of how old they get and how much, uh, how much offspring they have, this can really um, mess up our understanding of their life histories and make, uh, make policymakers make the incorrect decisions to protect these species. So I'm going to do a quick overview, uh, kind of an example of uh, a group of sharks, the, the ghost sharks, and how, um, how complicated the taxonomy can be. Carl Linnaeus actually named the first ghost shark in 1758, uh, and his description was highly qualitative. He mostly talked about the conical-shaped snout, the large spine, the large eye, the tapering body, and this worked uh, for his description um, because it was the only species known for that group. Uh, but this was kind of like describing the first bat. Um, a bat is pretty different from a mouse, it's pretty different from a turtle, but they're not different from a lot of other bats. Uh, so in um, the mid-1700s it, it worked, um, and then about almost 100 years later another one was described, but you can see that a lot more species were described, um, and now we have over 50 and they're pretty hard to tell apart. Um, color is not really a reliable character uh, for this, this group, and so a lot of the time you're trying to describe uh, the relative shapes of the fins or the body. Dominique Didier in 2002 uh, published what has been um, kind of the, uh, the standard way for measuring these ghost sharks um, with a, a series of measurements, and I actually was lucky enough to work with her, and I was surprised that she said a lot of these measurements don't do anything. Um, you know, that they take them, they're, they're what's being used, but um, they, they're not very descriptive. And the way that she tells them apart are largely on uh, qualitative things like stockiness of the body or how skinny the tail looks. So I actually worked with her to come up with a series of measurements that would better describe um, ghost sharks and, and be able to discern between species. So we came up with nearly 100 measurements, um, and I took them for about a little bit over 100 specimens, and you can see that they actually uh, could tell the species apart pretty well. We could look at the individual uh, measurements and how well they define the species. So you can see uh, there is some overlap, but more or less they fall out separately. And then what we wound up doing is we uh, ran an analysis to see how much uh, each measurement contributed to a species being dissimilar to other species. And we were able to rank them uh, for the most important characters to the least important characters. So I think this was a great study. Um, it was a first attempt to quantify the efficacy of measurements for defining species. Um, and it's useful, but it's mostly useful in the lab. It's hard to take a bunch of measurements at sea on a moving boat. Um, and it also kind of requires an expert. You have to be familiar with what the measurements are and how to take them. Plus, there's still a um, kind of the aspect of just having an eye for it. There's certain qualitative things like um, the curve of the spine, the waves of the fin, and that would require actually taking 
uh, measurements of the angles, and that's just not happening at sea. So while, uh, while I think this is a good step, I think artificial intelligence could be the next step for being a, uh, better able at defining these species. So I think a lot of us are familiar with um, Google's unsupervised training of uh, artificial intelligence to identify cats. Um, what they did was they just took a whole bunch of images of cats, they dumped that in the training program, and they were able to create a neural network that could identify cats or not cats, in this case, um, a cat or a dog. And I think we should start trying to do that with sharks. So we could do a uh, cat shark or not cat shark, like this dogfish. Um, so the reason why this, this could be a little bit hard is you need a very large data set. You need lots and lots of pictures, but we are working with the fishers and we have access to a large volume of pictures that they've been taking for a while and they're volunteering to continue taking for us. Um, we'll have the ability to identify these sharks. I've been working in this area for a long time. And we have the advantage of not only having the photographs, but having a taxonomic description. And we're going to have a genetic barcode for each one of these. So we're going to have tissue that we're going to run the genetics for and keep a physical specimen in a mu uh, museum collection. And with this, it will help us better identify these sharks. Uh, I've worked for the UN in um, identification workshops, and um, there's a lot of information at once. Some of the, the catalogs and um, identification books are a little bit dense. And so I'm hoping with this, we can back generate some better distinguishing characters and make it easier for people to use in the field. I think it will complement workshops and guides and help people uh, better able to identify these sharks. We can do it. Um, from a photograph being sent in from the field, and hopefully down the line, we could make it so you could actually use it in the field. And I think this better identification will lead to uh, better data coming from non-experts, and that will lead to better life history information, a more reliable uh, estimate of how old they get, how big they get, um, and what kind of uh, human fishing pressure they can, uh, they can withstand, and that will lead to better management. Right now, we are in the very beginning steps of this. We are still working with the fishers. We're uh, acquiring the photographs. Um, and I am very happy to talk to you if you have any questions or you're interested in collaborating. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, my question to you is a little bit um, coming from the experience we've had over the last few days and, and working from those keys and, and, and books towards systems which might be a bit more intuitive. We, you probably heard of iSharkfin, which again, try to triangulate across different sections of, of a shark to understand its fin. Um, and I'm wondering if there is an opportunity to not just take the pictures that you're looking for and get the uh, DNA barcode, but also take macro shots of different parts of the shark. So we've been hearing today about how adding tail and head shape to a recognition software is allowing sharks to be more quickly cored down, sorry, tuners, more quickly cored down to which species they are, even though the, the video recognizes that it's a tuner very quickly. And I just wonder how, how much experience or what type of crossover you're getting from other people's experience, which might allow you to, for example, just taking pictures of an eye or just taking pictures of a tail, along with the other types of pictures you take of the whole um, shark and, and see how potentially these, these allow you to, to get to where we want to get to more quickly. Thanks. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And there are parts of, um, you know, sharks that are, um, <clears throat> important for telling apart the species, but that's often like in the groups, you know, it's kind of when you identify sharks, you kind of go through uh, kind of like the key, if it has this fin or that spine, you separate it. Um, and in some groups, um, you know, uh, towards the back of the tail, there's a, a, a mark that is helpful, or in some groups, it's the, the angle of the arch of the mouth. And so it would be um, probably useful to have in, in combination with a, the classic full lateral um, some other images. And that would probably mostly be group specific, um, you know, whether it's uh, guided by an app or if you just take a suite of photographs and we're able to use those. Um, but there are definitely some weird things like that. You know, I, I've noticed, um, you know, when the sharks are still in the, in the net, you can see through the mesh and I'll know what species it is by looking at a piece of the snout. But I'm like, that's really not very descriptive. But I think, you know, being exposed to a lot of them, you wind up like noticing 
that kind of thing, which AI could definitely um, pick up on. Yeah, I'm just seeing this from the perspective of deep water sharks because we just don't get the numbers on deck. So maybe we, we need multiple shots to help us to call down. Max, can you give us some any uh, questions to add to this? Yeah, I, I'm really fascinated by this um, progression of uh, species identification from traditional uh, measurements um, through to through to AI, looking at biometric data there. Um, and it's kind of interesting because AI can kind of discover traits which might not be, um, uh, which the taxonomist might not use. Uh, it might discover some characteristic. I was wondering if you'd explored um, uh, looking at point cloud data from multiple images because uh, the, the actual geometric curves around the surface between key points, for example, might the, the uh, uh, good indicators uh, which which might provide more information. Had you considered using um, point cloud data, for example, from photogrammetry? Uh, I haven't, but that's a fantastic idea. I, I've thought about, you know, trying to do, um, you know, uh, like a like a kind of cheap 3D scan with a bunch of pictures that you stitch together. But um, point clouds would be interesting, especially if you can, um, you know, label them as uh, you know, uh, points that can be easily re-identified like at the beginning of the spine or something like that, and then um, have all the measurements um, to identify like what actually contributes to them being uh, discernible. Uh, that's a good idea. I haven't thought about that, but um, something to consider. Got another quick question from Anton. Uh, yes, um, uh, a really quick one. Uh, so how do you deal with uh, gravity? Uh, because a fish in the water looks very different from a fish on a taxonomous table. Yeah? So oh, um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think it would mostly be um, a, a tool to be used on, on, on the deck, you know, um, by an observer for the fish that are coming up. Um, so that, I mean, I, I think there's, a, you know, there's a lot of sharks that are getting caught out there and um, we're not getting the data back because uh, they can't identify it. And even if they take data, sex, length, material, location, that data is is useless if you don't know what species it is, and it's even less useful if it's a mix of different species. So, if we can start using it as a tool for um, factory workers or observers to be able to tell what species it is and collect those um, data points, that's fantastic. The idea of uh, identifying it in the water would be, uh, I mean, would be fantastic. And you know, think about how many deep sea surveys we could accomplish um, with with much less um, funding. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's probably a, a, another hurdle to overcome. A, swim, a, a fish swimming away into the darkness, as opposed to on the taxonomous table. Matt, that's your camera. Just a quick yeah. question from Anthony. He had his hand up, so I just chucked him into the mix. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, just a couple of comments and a question. So, um, given that you have a bunch of data and uh, images, and you have labels for the species in those images, you can just try Viami. So you can. Uh, it, it works directly for that problem. So you can see how well the existing deep learning classification methods in Viami work for your sharks. Uh, people have used Viami to distinguish now between hundreds of different fish species. And it's easier and harder, as, as you know, just from your own taxonomy work, some, some species are really hard to tell apart for a human and some are really easy. And that's true for the algorithms. So you might just try it and see which species are hard to distinguish from others and which are not. Deep learning, as Matt mentioned, um, will automatically learn the features that it's using to distinguish them. Um, there's nothing in Viami right now which will tell you whether the algorithm is paying attention to an eye or a fin or some part of the animal, but we're adding those features. Uh, that's called explainable AI. Uh, and it would actually tell you which part of the animal is used in the classification decision. Those capabilities exist uh, in general, uh, but not yet in Viami. So something to look forward to. And the last part about the having only a few instances, a few images for a given species, that's a really hard problem. So when you have very few, like just five or six images of this one species and being able to recognize that one, that probably won't work well in Viami. That requires methods for these few labels problem, which is still more of a research problem. So those are always going to be harder still. OK. okay. Well, thank you. We, uh, I, I, I wrote down, uh, I'm very excited to learn more about Viami. I yeah. have a little note over here. But yeah, yeah, it's very exciting. 
Thank you very much for that presentation, Paul, and thank you for throwing uh, explainable AI into the mix, which takes away the black box story and, and allows us really to start exploring.